There's a very like servient, uh, hospitable approach to West African culture. And that's the way I grew up, like passing that food around, serving each other. You don't serve yourself first. It just so happens that I fell into this, uh, this passion of food. I can never take for granted what I experienced at a young age and, and how I like to serve people. It always felt very second nature. I'm Grant Crilly. Join me as I travel across the country to meet chefs who are shaping our food culture. We learn about their ups, downs, successes, and heartbreaks. Where they come from, how they got here, and where they're going. Every route is different on the road to cooking. One of the things about Eric Ajapong is the guy you see on TV, the guy you see on social media, that's the real Eric Ajapong. That's who you get in real life. He's one of these genuinely loving souls who has a lot of chef talent, a lot of cooking talent. What up, buddy? What's going on, brother? Dude, how you doing? He's bringing a real sensibility around cooking from a cultural lean of West Africa. And also, he has this foundation of nutrition. I know I'm gonna have a good time with this guy. We're gonna do a lot of learning, exploring, and we're gonna do some cooking, get to know each other. My folks came from Ghana in the 80s, had me, uh, the first person in my family born in the States. Cooking uh, for my folks came out of necessity and, and also out of tradition, like listening to the oral kind of uh, uh, recipes that were kind of transferred to them and, and taught to them. So I grew up with three siblings, um, so I'm the middle child. And you know, it's wild because growing up uh, with so many people in the house, my mom and was always cooking. Like my dad helped 100%. My dad can help, <laughs> but it was definitely like my mom there. They um, won't stop eating. Yeah. <laughs> and she kept going. Yeah. Like, so, but she cooked out of like necessity. She cooked because like she, that was her way of showing love. My mom, um, she comes from, again, West Africa and the Shanti woman, like the tribe is so like loving and caring and how they show that is the expression is through cooking and, and really yeah. serving people. Watching mom cooking growing up and where you're at today, like how much of that are you taking forward? Subconsciously you pick stuff up, right? Yeah. And you see like just even the cadence and the timing in which she like cooks certain things, like she would stew meats first, allow that to rest, like gather all the juices and use that to kind of repurpose, like all that, it those steps. Ingrained. I'm telling you, man, yeah. it really does. And you kind of see it even like in, in formal training, this is how like you were taught formally in, in school and, and you work in a restaurant. So you can see like, even though we're cooking completely different like cultural foods, like the technique and the care behind the ingredients are pretty much the same. This is uh, <laughs> this brings back a lot of like good and bad memories. This would be my mom's the tool that she would make like poopoo with. But yes, exactly. Whenever uh, we got rowdy in the house, this always came in handy. Stir, scrape, eat, <laughs> smack, smack around. You know, you grew up in a very cooking household. Yeah. Do you feel like there was a moment or? It was a blur of when you like fell into food or got into cooking. When did you know or when did you fall into it? It was that guidance counselor moment in high school. It was like, all right, so you sat me down and it was like, what is it that you want to do? I, I just remember just like the love and the passion for turning something into something else with heat and, and, and it just it completely blew my mind. And then on top of that, I thought it was like a superpower to bring people together. So coming from a West African household, uh, if you're not like a doctor or a lawyer or anything like prestigious like that, then it's really hard to come home and like explain to your parents what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. So I did the nutrition at first to kind of like appease a little bit Soften of that. Blood, yeah, like yeah, so well, exactly <laughs> that. I went into culinary school, worked in a couple of different restaurants, just wanted to get my hands on the best places I can uh, essentially work in. And then I moved, I moved to England, London, England, uh, studied for my master's in international public health nutrition. And I came back, I started working uh, as a nutritional educator and, and teaching folks about bridging the gap between like cooking a great meal, but then actually understanding the science behind that. Oh uh, yeah. I'm ready to go, man. Ready yeah. to go. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Good, good. How's everything? Nice. Thank you so much Hi. for having us. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, it smells so good. It smells amazing. Mm. Wow. <laughs> So we're about to get a nice little spread, braised chicken, braised lamb, some sambusas, nice little cold salad, and just a really like simple lunch. 
Do you ever think about this through like the nutritional lens or your modern cooking lens then? When it comes to like a lot of the traditional recipes, I think hand in hand, they, be, they kind of lean towards more of like a nutritional kind of like way of cooking. Um, blanching, steaming, drying out or like fermenting. Really trying to preserve the nutrients um, in anything that we're cooking. Industrialization kind of like changed the way we cooked as well. Like folks are not spending as much time at home. Yeah. You gotta be out at work. So I feel like I'm adding my own kind of like chapter to kind of carry those traditions of like traditional West African cooking and, and make sure they have a really long lasting kind of effect on the food. Cheers to you. Thank you, my friend. It's so exciting to be in a chef's town, really to hear their story, the elements that make them who they are. But in the end, I want to get in the kitchen and I want to cook with them. So we're making a braised cabbage and we're doing a really nice play on a verb blonde, but we're doing it with the coconut cream. Taking a little bit of white wine, we're taking a coconut vinegar as well. Not only is it really sweet, um, it's super pungent, right? So you know exactly what you're getting yeah. when you had it. Throw this base right in there. We can turn this on. Tablespoons of some ginger. Base. You cook this fast? Probably going <laughs> as fast as I am. I'll be right there. Dinner's gonna be ready real quick. <laughs> It's so hard. I'm in competition mode all the time, dude. Like, it's so hard not to do that. We have a little bit of red onion, so I'm trying to just, like, aromatics doing this thing right there. I'll let that reduce by half so it's super, like, syrupy, but then also, like, the flavors intensify really, really, like, drastically. We'll cut these up in planks, maybe, like, a half inch thickness. A little oil. A little bit of salt on both sides. White pepper. I'm gonna chop up some thyme, some garlic, and I'm gonna use that to kind of brush up on the, uh, the cabbage itself as well. So we set up an oven for 425 degrees Fahrenheit, roast really nice and beautifully in the oven. It has a little bit of char, there's a little bit of crunch to it, but it's super tender. So, we good enough juice here? I think so. Probably about a few tablespoons, maybe an ounce or so. Yeah, plenty. Yeah. So you just want the acid, right? I just want the acid, yeah. See how beautiful that color is. We start off in a clean pan. We'll bring back this little uh, reduction right here. Add in a little bit of that coconut cream. So once we get a nice kind of warm temp, I would say anything at least underneath 100 degrees, then we can kind of come in with some cold butter. Once the uh, planks come out the oven, we'll hit it with that uh, beautiful coconut bernays and a little bit of uh, crispy garlic. And then we'll garnish it with some fresh dill. It's done. Meeting Eric, it was abundantly clear that this guy is just full of love. He's got a ton of energy. He's bringing a real sense of what's good for people, what's healthy for people. That really resonated with me. I wanted to make sure that the food that I was cooking is not only just like feeding my own ego and I can do whatever I want creatively, but I'm actually doing something like practical. I'm actually doing something that uh, makes a difference. I love that aspect of being a chef and it's not just about serving food, but it's also about, you know, serving people.